So to solve this, you use theorem 55, the product rule, and the chain rule. There's, there's a comment. I've realized, Doctor, that being quick when answering is important. Um, quick and careful. Quick and careful. Um, not for MCQ, but for written question, yes. Mr. Erasmus, are you happy with that? For a for, uh, MCQ question, you don't have to show why the conditions are met, but for a written question, you have to. We want complete answers for written questions. That is very important. So just quickly, admin-wise, please revise all the work. Um, I hope you have done homework three. You need to hand in homework three when you step into the tutorial. And we have tutorial three. Some of you on a Monday, some of you on a Thursday, some of you on a Friday. Please go early to tutorials. Please go early to tutorials. If your tutorial starts at two o'clock, be at the tutorial at two o'clock. Don't pitch up 10 minutes late to the tutorial. Alrighty, so without any further ado, let's get to chapter three work. Let's talk about partial derivatives. Now, the first thing we need to talk about is first order partial derivatives. And we have two of them, f partial x and f partial y. So f partial x at the point a, b is also notated by the partial symbol f partial x, vertical line a, b, and it's defined as a limit h goes to zero of f a plus h comma b minus f a, b over h. And then f partial y at the point a, b, if it exists, is also defined as partial f over partial y. So this is the partial symbol vertical line a b and that's equal to the limit h goes to zero of f a comma b plus h minus f a b over h can i get a smiley face that you have written down these definitions over the weekend so one is along the x axis one is along the y axis you got to know these two definitions this is how you calculate partial derivatives from definition it's important that you know how to calculate they don't always exist, but this is the definition for f partial x and f partial y. Now, there's a very interesting question on Discord. How does the domain of first orders work? And here it is. The domain of f partial x is defined as all of the 2D vectors that's in the domain of f such that f partial x at that point exists. Likewise, the domain of f partial y is defined as all the 2D vectors which is in the domain of f such that f partial y at that point exists. Are there any questions on these definitions? So the first two is the definition of f partial x and f partial y at a specific point. The next two is the definition of the domain of first orders. Pretty straightforward exactly as we expect it to be. Alrighty. Now we can also have fun with second order partial derivatives. And we talk about the pure ones. So if foot script double X, look at the notation. It's the partial symbol with exponent two F partial symbol X squared. Can I get a yes in the chat that you see the, the order at the top? It's the partial symbol two, so you do two partial derivatives. But at the bottom, it's partial x squared, which means you differentiate with respect to x twice. Some textbooks also denote this as partial partial x of partial f partial x. And some textbooks also denote this taking f partial x, that function partial x at the point x, y. So there are many ways of notating this pure second order. Likewise, we can also notate f partial double y. So it is doing two partials with respect to y twice. And again, there are various ways of saying the same thing. So you're taking f partial it with x, then partialing it with x again. Likewise, f partial double y is taking f partialing with y and partialing it with y again. Then you also get the mixed 
second order derivatives. Now look at what I write down. F foot script XY, if you write it in this notation, it is a partial twice of partial Y partial X. Because what this means is you go from left to right. So you take F, you partial it with X, then you partial it with Y. So it's like a machine. You take F, you partial it with X, you put it in brackets and you partial it with Y. And it's also notated like this, the very last expression on the line. Likewise, F partial Y X is this, or it is F partialing with Y, then partialing it with X. Some textbooks also write it as taking F, partialing it with Y, then partialing it with X at the point X, Y. Are there any questions on the notation? Please write this out. Make sure that you are comfortable with the notation. So there are two first order partial derivatives. There are four second order partial derivatives. F double X, F double Y, F X, Y, and F Y X. Who can tell me in the chat, if you have a function of two variables, how many third order partial derivatives are there? If it's a function of two variables, if you list all of the third order partial derivatives, indeed a gold star to everybody saying eight. Those of you doing statistics and combinatorics, you can list them. There are eight in total. It actually gets a lot of fun if you list all the third order partial derivatives of a function of two variables. So well done, the answer is indeed eight. It gets quite a lot of fun. So obviously you can talk about higher order partial derivatives and there are branches of applied maths, physics, chemistry, economics, where this is useful. So there's a question, do we have to do partial derivatives by definition? Um, the golden rule, read the problem and do what works best. Mr. Muller, can I get a smiley face? The golden rule is read the problem. If they don't specify, you can do anything that works. Emphasis on works. But if the problem says you've got to use definition, you've got to use a limit. All right, so here's, here's, a, here's a third order one. So F X Y Y means you take F, you partial it with X, you do the order from left to right. Then you take that result, you do it partial y, then you take that, you partial it with y. If g is a function of three variables, and you see g, foot script xz, at the point a, b, what you do is you take g, in this case, g is a function of three variables, so x, y, z, then you first do it with partial x. Can I get a smiley face that the order matters? This is one, and this is two. So you take g, you partial it with X, that result, you partial it with Y, and then the vertical line, you plug in A, B, C. Do not get lost in the notation. Do not get lost in the notation of plain first order partial derivatives, second order partial derivatives, or there are circumstances where you're going to need higher order partial derivatives. And you can make infinitely many examples. Alrighty. Now, there's a beautiful theorem, 59, that says that if f is a function of two variables, x and y, with domain d, a subset of R2, which is an open set, that's the one condition, and if all of the second order partial exist on d, and the last condition is that all of them are continuous at the point a, b, then the mixed order fxy and fyx is the same. This is theorem 59. So there are occasions where it is the same. This is named after French mathematician, Alexis Clarot, where if you have a function of two variables on an open set D and all other second order partial derivatives exist on D and they're all continuous at the point AB, then they do agree. So this is theorem 59. You do not have to know the proof of theorem 59. But something curious happens. And I want you guys to quickly vote on this. So it's a simple yes, no. 
imagine you have a function. You know that f partial x, y at the origin exists, and f partial y, x at the origin exists. Must they be equal? That is, can we apply theorem 59? So look at this question. I want to hear what you guys are thinking. So let's wait till the majority vote. So the first question you can ask yourself, can I apply theorem 59? And the answer is no, because we do not have continuity happening. We do not have continuity happening. So we cannot apply theorem 59. And I'm going to wait for three more people to vote. Can we get three more people to vote? Two more people to vote? One more person to vote? Ah, thank you for voting. All right. It turns out that there are strange functions out there where this guy exists and this guy exists, but they are different values. So the answer to this question is not always. And if you want to see such a peculiar example, read example 58 in the textbook. So read example 58 in the textbook. There you have an example where those two quantities both exist, but they are different. So unfortunately, I don't have time in the lesson to do example 58. So have a look at example 58. It gives you an, an example where that quantity and that quantity both exist, but they are different. So it doesn't contradict theorem 59 because we do not have continuity. All right. So do try it out today. It's a fun little exercise. All right. Um, I'm going to leave this as homework and I'm going to leave this as homework. So have a look at my lecture notes later on. What I want to do is move swiftly on to chapter 3.2. Are there any questions? Are there any questions before I move on to chapter 3.2? So now we're done with chapter 3.1. You need to understand directional derivatives and you need to understand partial derivatives, first order, second order, etc. All righty, there aren't any questions. Then we're moving on to chapter 3.2, talking about differentiability. So my first remark is the following. There are examples of functions where all the directional derivatives exist, but it doesn't guarantee continuity. And we know that in first year that if a function is differentiable it is continuous so directional derivatives is not enough so we need a new definition okay so there are strange functions out there where all the directional derivatives exist but it doesn't imply continuity so we need a new definition and this is the big definition of chapter 3.2 and it goes as follows. It's a mouthful. Let f be a function of two variables defined on domain D, which is a subset of R to an open set. Assume that AB is the element of D such that f partial x at the point AB and f partial y at the point AB exist. Can I get a yes that you guys see this? This is part of the definition. That if partial x at that point exists and if partial y at that point exists, please read definitions carefully. You need to read definitions carefully. Then what we do is we define the crocodile. So for a non-zero vector hk, we let capital E be defined as follows. So the crocodile, so capital E at the 2D vector hk is defined as f at a plus h comma b plus k minus f a b minus h f partial x at the point minus k f f partial y at the point over the root of h squared plus k squared so it's essentially the norm of this vector so please write down the crocodile so you have a function f partial x and f partial y at that point exist then what we do is we define the crocodile the crocodile is this fraction. Are there any questions so far? So this is the formula for the crocodile. If somebody wakes you up in the middle of the night, you need to know the formula for the crocodile. 
If somebody wakes you up in the middle of the night, you need to know the formula for the crocodile. All right. Um, chapter 3.3 will explain it a bit more. All right. So please read chapter 3.3 and see if you can figure out yourself. See if you can figure it out yourself. Part of mathematics is you need to try to figure out why do we have these definitions? What is the use of the definitions? All right. Now we get to complete the definition. If is differentiable at this point, if and only if, the limit as HK approaches the origin of the absolute value of the crocodile is equal to zero. So if F is differentiable, then the limit of the absolute value of the crocodile is zero. And if the limit of the absolute value of the crocodile is zero, then F is differentiable at that point. Are there any questions on the definition? So for now, don't question the definition. Just make sure you understand what the definition is saying. So this is definition 60 in the book. This is definition 60 in the book. Are there any questions? So this is what it means for a function of two variables to be continuous. Can I get a smiley face if you're happy with this definition? You, all right, there's some strange faces. Yes, you got to learn to love this definition. You've got to learn to love this definition. And I want you guys to do a problem like this every day for a week. I want you guys to do a problem like this every day for a week so that you are comfortable with this definition. Okay? You've got to be really, really, really comfortable with this definition. Okay. So let me unpack this definition just a little bit. All right? So what can we conclude? Yes. Yes, Rob. It is if and only if. So the first thing that we can see that if f partial x at the point a, b doesn't exist, then f is not differentiable at that point because the definition fails, so we don't have differentiability. If f partial y at the point do not exist, then f is not differentiable at that point. Can I get a yes that you understand my first two remarks? In the first two remarks, if one of the first order partials don't exist, then the definition fails and we do not have differentiability. Good. Now let me give you a typical recipe how to prove differentiability at a point. Step one, you've got to show that f partial x and f partial y at that point exist. Step two, for a non-zero vector, you define the crocodile. And your job is to show that the limit of the absolute value of the crocodile is zero. You typically use the squeeze theorem. So there's a question. So when you say differentiability, do you mean, uh, uh, Mohammed? So this is global differentiability. That's a very good question. So you don't add a variable. Mohammed, can I get a smiley face? So you talk about differentiability at a point. So you do not add a variable. So you got to read the fine print. Thank you, Mohammed, for that great question. So we're talking about differentiability at a point. So if you want to prove differentiability at the point AB, can I get a smiley face that you guys see the following three steps? You show that the first orders exist at that point. Then you define the crocodile. Then your goal is to show that the limit of the absolute value of the crocodile is zero. You typically use the squeeze theorem. And how do you get good at doing this? Uh, no, Muhammad. No, Muhammad. <laughs> um, see the tough question this week, Muhammad. Yes, practice, 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 practice. The only way to get good with these kind of questions is to practice, 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 practice. All right, Muhammad, please stay behind you to answer your question at the end. All right. Now, to prove not differentiability, if you can show that the limit of the absolute value of the crocodile is non-zero, then f is not differentiable at that point, and we typically use theorem 45, i.e. a path. 
So typically to prove non-differentiability, we you will use a path. And I will do examples of both today. I will do examples of both today. All right. So let's first do this example. Here's a function of two variables. Let's do the following. Let's find f partial x at the origin. So who can tell me by theorem 55, what is f partial x equal to? Tell me in the chat. So f is the function x squared plus y squared minus xy. Who can tell me in the chat what is f partial x? So don't do the limit calculation. You can if you want to. Yep, well done. It is 2x minus y. So f partial x at the origin is twice 0 minus 0, which is 0. Let's do part B. So by theorem 55, f partial y. So now you treat, for the first one, you treat y as a constant and you do partial derivatives. Now you treat x as a constant and you do the derivatives. Who can tell me what is f partial y of this function? It's 2y minus x. Marco, can I get a smiley face that you see it's 2y minus x? Marco, can I get a smile? Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. And so f partial y at the origin exists and it's zero. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? So step one, we want to know differentiability at the origin. So we need the first order partials at the origin. All right, so this is step one. Now step two, we got to define the crocodile. So taking a non-zero 2D vector, let E be defined as follows. So it's F of zero plus H, zero plus K minus F of zero, zero minus H, F partial X at the origin minus K, F partial Y at the origin over the root, it always the root plus h squared plus k squared. So looking at this function, what is f at the origin equal to? Remember the function is x squared plus y squared minus xy. So what is f at the origin? Ben is saying zero. Yep, yeah, it is indeed zero. All right. So if we do this calculation, this quantity is zero, this quantity is zero, this quantity is zero. So f of hk, f of hk becomes h squared plus k squared minus hk over the square root of h squared plus k squared. Are there any questions? So we got the first order partials. They both exist at the origin, they're both zero, so not interesting. And we got the crocodile. Are there any questions so far? Remember, as I said before, practice, 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 practice. Do the examples in the textbook. Do the exercises in the textbook. Yes, Ben. Can I get a smiley face? H times zero is zero. Ben, that's real numbers. Ben, can I get a smiley face? H times zero is zero. K times zero is zero. Ben, smiley face, please. Yes, great. <laughs> okay. So now we got to do part D. So now we got to prove F is differentiable. So the trick is to look at the absolute value of e so we look at the absolute value of the crocodile so we look at the absolute value of a crocodile so this is how we're going to tackle this all right um bonkiwe try it at home bonkiwe try it at home or stay after after the lesson all right let's first focus on this problem now i told you guys we're going to use the squeeze theorem so when we use the squeeze theorem, we need what, ladies and gentlemen? If we, if we use the squeeze theorem, we need what? A bottom function and top function. What is the bottom function? Who can tell me what is the bottom function? Yes. Can I get a smiley face that you guys all agree that this is true? Can I get a smiley face that you guys agree that the absolute value of E is greater or equal to zero? All right. That's good. Okay, now to create a top function, what do you guys think we will use to create a top function? What trick will we use to create a top function? So 
Yes, Miss Dubé. A gold star to Miss Dubé. We are going to use the triangle inequality. So we're going to use the triangle inequality. So I'm going to have zero is less or equal to the absolute value of E. I'm going to take it slow. Um, can I get a smiley face? So this is my first part and this is my second part. So if I use the triangle inequality, I end up, you will see I'm very clever because I have done a hundred or a thousand of these problems already. I am very clever and I'm going to write it like this. Can I get another smiley face? I'm using the triangle inequality and, I, and I'm writing it like this. Good. All right, please go home and redo this example. So now I end up getting this. Can I simplify this green term? Can I simplify this green term? Can I simplify this green term? Yes. I was very clever. This becomes that. All right. P over root P. So P over root P becomes root P if P is greater or equal to zero. I'm using this. What is the absolute value of minus H? The absolute value of minus H is the absolute value of H. So I have it like this. And the absolute value of K, I'm going to write it like this. Are there any questions? So the first term simplifies to this. The absolute value of minus H is the absolute value of H. And K can be written as the root of K squared. Alrighty, so now we continue and we write it like this. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Can I get a smiley face that you guys see that this is okay? I'm making root k squared into root k squared plus h squared. Because now you see a little bit of Game of Thrones. That term and that term cancels. And now it becomes the following. So you have to dance with inequality so that you end up getting it like this. Now who can tell me why is this special? Why is this right hand side special? There's many ways you can do it. So the textbook, you can play either with H or K. Um, ben, it's not a polynomial. Ben, there's roots. Nope, 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 nope. Why is the right-hand side special? Why is this part special? Anybody? Because it's a non-fraction. It has domain. So if you consider this as a function of two variables, the domain is the entire 2D plane. Can I get a smiley face that you guys see this? The reason why we like the bottom and the top because they are functions defined everywhere and it's no longer fraction. So this is the tricks that they employ in example 62 in the textbook as well. You, you do this so that the bottom and the top are non-fractions. Okay, and now let's do the math. So the limit as we approach the origin of zero is equal to zero. Who can tell me what the reason is? Who can tell me what is the reason? Why is the limit as we approach the origin of zero, zero? The constant limit law, Lizuku. Yep, it's the constant limit law. So it's the constant limit law. All right now you can be a little bit laborious and you can say the following you can say okay the limit as we approach the origin of h squared plus k squared is equal to zero squared plus zero squared what's the reason what's the reason for saying that these limits exist ben yes ben quite right Polynomials are continuous everywhere.
Now, who can tell me what is special about these functions? F equal to root x is what on this interval? And gx is equal to the absolute value x is what on this interval? Anybody? What, what, what goes in the dot, Mr. Adebayo? Mr. Adebayo, what goes in the dot? Yes, yes, it's continuous. And so we can say, um, and by theorem 42, that is the sum law. And I believe theorem 42, it's part seven. Let me just double check. So theorem 42, Part seven, if you compose continuous functions with continuous functions, we see that therefore that the limit as hk approaches the origin of the square root of h squared plus k squared plus the absolute value of h is equal to zero. Are we in business, anybody? Are we in business? Why are we in business? Who can tell me why are we in business? Why are we in business? Anybody? Yes, Ben, that's what I'm looking for. The squeeze theorem. So the crocodile lies between two functions. The limit of the bottom is zero. The limit of the top is zero. So you can now say the following. By the squeeze theorem, I want to see this reason. So by the squeeze theorem, the limit as hk approaches the origin of the absolute value of the crocodile is equal to zero. So by definition, f is differentiable. And what is the keyword here? f is differentiable at the point zero, zero. Are there any questions on this proof? So the limit of zero is zero. The limit of the top is zero using theorem 42. And so we can safely say we have enough evidence by the squeeze theorem. The limit of the absolute value of E exists and it's zero. So therefore, by the definition, F is differentiable at the origin. Are there any questions on this calculation? So please go home and redo this problem that you are comfortable proving definition. It's a strange definition, but it, it turns out to be a good definition. So you gotta to learn to love the best definition, Ben. You gotta to learn to love this definition. So it took us four weeks, but we are finally at the stage where we can talk about differentiability. It took us four weeks, but we finally have a way of defining differentiability. All right, so please do this question later today, again, to see how you get to use all these little tricks. All right, let's have a look at my second example for the day. Um, the tip is, read the problem. Read the problem. Sometimes you got to do them all if it's not broken down. Okay, so golden rule, read the problem. And if it's not broken down, you got to find the first order partials, find the crocodile, do the limit of the absolute value of the crocodile using the squeeze theorem. So the golden rule is always read the problem. All right, so let's have a look at this little problem over here. Can I get a yes that you guys see that this is a piecewise function? If you're at the origin, the output is zero. If you're not at the origin, the output is given by this. This is a tricky one, so please do it later today. So for part A, for directional derivatives, you always need a unit vector. I can't emphasize this enough. We're gonna catch you guys in the semester test. For directional derivatives, you always need a unit vector. So if you take this unit vector, you can prove that this directional derivative is equal to zero if the first component's naught, or it's u2 squared over u1 if the first component is non-zero. So 
Who can give me a strategy to do part A? Who can give me a strategy to do part A? Anybody, how would you do part A? Seeing what you should get, what will the strategy be for part A? Yes, Ben, obviously we're going to use the definition, but also peeking ahead to the answer. What I will do is the, for the following. So case one would be if u1 equal to zero, use definition. And then case two will be if u1 is not equal to zero, use definition. So I'm going to leave it for you as homework. So the way to tackle part A is cases. So you've got to do two cases. If U1 is zero, use the definition. See if you agree with this answer. And then case two, if U1 is not zero, use the definition and see that you get this. Alrighty. Now, obviously in this question, we've broken it down to help you out here. So to continue, if partial X is the origin, is the directional derivative in which direction? Which unit vector do we use to find f partial x? Nope, I, I need a unit vector, Jaden. Jaden, I need a unit vector. So f partial x is a directional derivative using which unit vector? Yes, Elizabeth. Well done, Elizabeth. Can I get more one zeros? Yes, one zeros. All right. So my question is, do I use part one or part two? Do I use part one or do I use part two? Part one or part two now? Yeah, it's part two. So you can see here u1 equal one. So we're using this part. So it becomes zero squared over one, which is zero by a. And likewise, f partial y at the origin is a directional derivative. Which unit vector do we use? Which unit vector do we use to do f partial y? Yeah, bo. And now you can see this will now be u1 is equal to zero. So the answer is zero by part a. Can I get a yes? You see how part A helps us to do part B. Can I get a yes how part A helps us to do part B? It's very cool. So please go home and redo this later today. All right. Now that we know that the first order partials exist, what is the next step to prove differentiability? What is the next step to prove differentiability? Anybody? The crocodile, yes. The crocodile is step two. The crocodile is step two. So now we've got to pull out the crocodile. So now we've got to say, if we're not at the origin, then our friend, the crocodile, is defined to be f of zero plus h zero plus k minus f of zero zero minus h f partial x at the origin minus k f partial y at the origin over the square root of h squared plus k squared. Now I'm not going to bore you. k times 0 is 0. h times 0 is 0. f with the origin is 0. So double check later today that you agree that the crocodile ends up being the following. It ends up being h k squared over h squared plus k to the power 4 all over the root of h squared plus k squared which then obviously if you turn it into a fraction, it becomes this. Can I get the word brackets? Brackets are your friends. It's very important for brackets. Oh, Elizabeth found <laughs> the emoji for crocodile. Are there any questions so far? So you could use part A or you could do it without part A, but because it's a piecewise function, you got to be careful. Step one is done and dusted. Step two, we have the crocodile. And then step three, we are going to show 
that it doesn't exist. Now, to show it doesn't exist, we just need one path. So we are going to show non-existence. So I'm going to play here for a little while. Yes. So require to prove the limit as HK going to the origin of the absolute value of E is not equal to zero. Mr. Erasmus, can I get a smiley face that you're happy with that? Good. So to do this, I just need one path, one path plus theorem 45. And the trick is to think. Can I get the word think? I was a bit worried when I was marking semester test one that some of you guys haven't learned to think. You got to learn to think. You got to learn to think. So if we look at h squared plus k to the power four, can we simplify that? Can we simplify h squared plus k to the power four? Can we simplify h squared plus k to the power four any further? How, Marco? The answer is no, there's no common factor. No, there's no common factor. H squared plus k to the power four, there's no common factor. All right, but let's do the following. If k is equal to t, then we have h squared plus t to the power four. And so what do you think will be a nice value for h, for them to be similar terms? So if you let your imagination go and your creativity goes, yes, Nicole, yes, Ms. Dubé, all right? So t squared, all right? And this is the trick. This is the trick. So path, let's try the following path, t squared t. Guys, in this week's tutorial, a mark is allocated for saying the following. Note r is continuous. If you plug in the origin, you're at the, if you plug in zero, you're at the origin. And that RT is not the origin if T is not zero. Are there any questions? This is very important. Remember it for this week's tutorial. If you have a path, you've got to make sure it's a nice path. Can I get a smiley face? So this is a nice path because R bar is continuous. If you plug in T is zero, you're at the origin. And if t is non-zero, you're not at the origin. Please remember this for this week's tutorial. This is very important for this week's tutorial. Can I get another smiley face? Can I get another smiley face? Thank you, San Marie. Thank you. All right. Now, let's see, if, is this a good path? Let's see, is this a good path? So let's now get our hands dirty and do the limit as t goes to zero of the absolute value of, of e r t. So this becomes the limit as t goes to zero of the absolute value of e t squared t. So plugging it, remember our crocodile is defined as follows. So let me repeat the crocodile. It's this guy over here, h k squared. So let me just repeat that over here. So it is h k squared over h squared plus k to the four, the root of h squared plus k squared. So this is the h value and this is the k value. So we have h times k squared. And let me just be careful with my notation. The limit t goes to zero, absolute value over, we have h squared, which is t to the four plus t, uh, k to the four, which is t to the four. Then we have the square root of h squared, which is t to the four plus t squared. Can I get a yes that you guys agree what I'm doing here? So, I'm replacing h with t squared. I'm replacing k with t, and it becomes this. And you can see why do we do this 
because you can see the following happening. T squared times T squared is T to the four. T squared plus T squared is twice T squared. So you can see a little bit of magic happens. So this becomes the following. I'm going to write it as follows. One at the top, two at the bottom, root T to the four plus T squared. Okay, and now, if T is close to zero, the top is close to one. If T is close to zero, the bottom is close to which value? Please go home, redo, rewrite, revise this problem later today. It's zero. But can you guys be a little bit more specific? The top is close to one, the bottom is close to zero, but can it ever be negative? Nope, it's zero plus. This is what I'm looking for. The reason is it's the type is one over zero plus. So what is the answer to this limit problem? What is the answer to this limit problem? So it's one over zero plus. So one divided by 0 0.1, one divided by 0 0.001, one divided, yep. So it's infinity or do not exist. Are we happy? Are we happy everybody? Are we jumping for joy? Yes, because now we can say by theorem 45. Can you guys please type the word theorem 45 in the textbook? We found a path not going to zero. We found a path not going to zero. So this one actually doesn't exist, but infinity do not exist. But we now have enough evidence to say by theorem 45, the limit as HK going to the origin of the absolute value of the crocodile is not zero. So by definition, F is not differentiable at the origin. Are there any questions on this calculation? So we found a path not going to zero. So by theorem 45, the limit of the absolute value of the crocodile is non-zero. So by definition, F is not differentiable at the origin. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Anybody? Any questions? Can I get a smiley face that you guys are happy with this example? So here is typically how you prove non-differentiability. So question C was, so why is this an interesting example? And let me let, put the cat out of the bag. This is a cool function because all directional derivatives existed. This is part A, which you will do at home today at the origin, but the function wasn't differentiable at the origin. Can I get a yes that you are going to redo this question later today? This function is very important because it shows us that there are functions out there where all the directional derivatives they exist this is part a i'm leaving this for you to do at home but the function was not differentiable at the origin okay so this is very important for our education of 218 yes <laughs> um can I get a smiley face that you see my comment on page five? Mr. Ayola, can I get a smiley face? You see my comment at the top of page five. If one of them don't exist, we are already, we can stop proving differentiability. All right. So please make sure you make summaries of this work. All right. Now, can we have the mean value theorem for functions of two variables? What do you guys think? Yes or no? Can we have the mean? Yep. We can. So we can, and this is very important for us. So in first year, the mean value theorem for single variable goes as follows. Let f be 
a function on closed interval AB to RB continuous? B and A are different. And it is differentiable on the open interval. Then there exists a C element of AB such that F dash C is equal to FB minus FA over B minus A. And we can rewrite this by saying FB minus FA is equal to F dash C times B minus A. So in a way, we are comparing FB minus FA to a point inside the interval F dash C times B minus A. Can I get a smiley face that you guys remember the mean value theorem from first year? So we compare F at one point minus F at other point in terms of a derivative. Okay, now we could do the same thing in 2D. So we, if you have two points, A, B and another point, A plus H, B plus A, the question is, can we relate F, Q minus F, B in terms of first order partials? And the answer is yes. This is captured in theorem 65. It, it's again a mouthful and it goes as follows. Let D be a subset of R to be open. Let F be a map from D to R and A, B is an element of D. Assume that F partial X and F partial Y exist on D. If HK is not the zero vector that is sufficiently small, then there exist special numbers, theta foot script H, theta foot script K, which is in the open interval from zero one, such that F at Q minus F at B is equal to H F partial X at a special point plus K F partial Y at a special point. So please read the proof in the textbook. This is pages 68 and 67 in the textbook. We may turn it into a comprehension question in semester test one. So this is the wording of the mean value theorem for a function of two variables, all right? And if you go through the proof in the textbook, it will show you why this is such an important result. And that is in 